show of hands as we get kicked off here this morning, show of hands, uh, how many of you have been, or better yet, are still confused at times when you start thinking deeply about God? Anybody? When you start contemplating God, it just kind of makes you scratch your head a bit, right? Anybody there with me? Like, I'm there. I, I'm like, I start thinking about God and, and who He is, and it starts... I mean, that's what, that's what keeps preacher's kids up at night. Yeah, I remember laying in bed long after the rest of the family had gone to sleep and just contemplating God, and it just kept me up at night often. I was out, what brought this to my thinking is I was out um, two nights ago with my, uh, my, my oldest daughter, my middle child, Callie, and we were at pizza before we were going to go over to uh, the, the Blazers game, and we're sitting there at pizza, at Mod Pizza, and um, she says this, Dad, uh, I never got this, and I don't think that anybody can know this, the answer to this question. Now, you have to ask, know my daughter, she asks a hundred questions all the time, like, every, it's a running commentary question, so she, when she says, I have a question, I don't think anybody knows the answer to. I was like, oh, okay, go ahead and hit me. She's like, I just really want to know when and how God the Father was born. She's six. And I'm like, that's a good question, sweetheart. You see, and I started trying to explain to her the, the eternality of God and, and the divinity of God and how he's always been. And, and she just kind of looks at me and is like, like look with, with this, these eyes like, that's not good enough, Dad. I need to know. Like, I need to know his birth date, you know? And I'm like, sweetheart, there are some things about God. And, and I told her, there's some things about God that we just won't ever know. And when I said that, she was a bit frustrated because she's a curious mind and she wants to figure everything out. And I said, there's just some things about God that we will never know, that we'll never figure out. And in that, and this will be a, a thing for her to come to, but for, for there's some of you that are frustrated by, you think you should know more, you think you should, you know, there's things about God that you just don't understand and that frustrates you. Just know that if you could figure God out completely, I think you're worshiping too small a God. You see, if your finite mind could figure out and know and contemplate and understand everything there is to know about God, your God is too small. And that you need to have a bigger picture, a blown up picture of who God is. Because there's just some things, there's some things that we just won't ever fully be able to comprehend about God. And I choose to think that that's a good thing. People in the Old Testament were more confused about who God is than we are today. Because we get the blessing of the New Testament, we get the blessing of seeing Jesus. But um, God would, so God, because the people were just so confused about who he is, God would speak through some guys named prophets to give them little snippets about who God is. They give us little, he gave the people of the Old Testament little snippets of who this coming Messiah would be. There, there was always this picture that there would be someone who's coming and he was going to save them from their sins. He was going to save the people of God. And so the prophets would give these little snippets and and pictures into who God would send as the Messiah. And one of them that we've been looking at this entire Christmas series is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was one of the guys, the prophets, that wrote a lot about who this coming Messiah, who we now know is Jesus, but he would write often about Here's another little snapshot of who this Messiah would be. Here's another little snapshot. Here's a little other snapshot. And the people didn't fully understand, much like we sit and we don't fully understand God, they really didn't understand. And so as we look at this, just know that as we talk about some of these attributes of who Jesus is, who this Messiah is this Christmas, as we contemplate Jesus this Christmas, just know there's probably going to be some things that make you scratch your head and go, huh? 
And there's probably some things that my six-year-old daughter could stump you on because she stumps us on constantly with her questions. And it's like, I don't know, sweetheart. <laughs> You're going to have to wait and ask God when we get there. But this snapshot that we've been looking at the last three weeks, Isaiah says this in chapter 9. God speaks through him. He says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Two weeks ago, we looked at this idea that Jesus comes as the Wonderful Counselor because we recognized all together that we're a little bit messed up. And that all of us have a problem with sin and all of us have a problem with understanding. And so Jesus comes as a wonderful counselor because we need a wonderful counselor. Last week we looked at the idea that Jesus is our mighty God because we are, as humans, we are weak and frail and we need a mighty God who's mighty to save us. And this morning we're going to look at this idea of an everlasting father. Few words uh, in language, invoke the kind of feeling that we have when we hear that word, Father, right? It does something, it stirs something within all of us when we hear that word, Father. For some of us, this time of year especially, but that word invokes this feeling of loss because our fathers are not with us any longer. For some, it invokes this feeling of, of anger or upset because maybe you live through a father who was either absent or worse off was there but didn't know how to truly father. So it stirs something in you. Still others of you, when you hear that word father, you, you think, man, I, I have a pretty good father. And maybe, maybe he's still around this and, and he's still here and, and what I what I just want to encourage you is cherish the moments with your father if you got a good one. But how comforting it is for us to read then the, the birth of this child whose name shall be everlasting father. We are under his care, his protection, his provision. But none, of all these names that we're going to look at this week, this is the one way that I struggled with most in my office this week. I'll just give you a little glimpse into the study habits. This mor the Monday morning, I opened up and I read this, and although I know this verse, it looks a little bit different. The verse takes on a new meaning when you've got to stand up and talk about it for 45 minutes. And so as I was reading back through it, I was reading this, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, I was like, whoa, hold on a second. In this verse alone, it creates this weird theolo theological mind for us to navigate because and if you just read through it and you're great with, you know, he's everlasting father, you're like, oh, that's really cool. Let me confuse you a little bit this morning before we unpack it because I think we should all be confused together because I was confused in my office, so let's, let me help confuse all of us so that you can know the level of... So we start out, for us, to us, a child is born, okay, child. For us, a son is given, and we're all like, oh yeah, of course, Jesus is the Son of God. The coming Messiah was going to be the Son of God, okay, that we have no problem with that theologically, so he's the Son is given, but then we come down here, and the Son's name shall be Everlasting Father? Not Everlasting Son, Everlasting Father. Now that's, that's weird, Right? How is the son the father? And when we dive into this idea, uh, okay, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna nerd out a little bit in theology for a second, and I promise we'll pop back out for some of you, okay? We have the doctrine of the Trinity, okay? We have God is three, one, one God, three distinct parts. The doctrine of Trinity means that there's one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, okay? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We all believe that, okay? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of God, if you're a, follower, a, a, a Christian, then, then you believe this, okay? That, that the doctrine of the Trinity is true. And so we have the three distinct personages, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Son, the Holy Spirit's not the Father, the Holy Spirit's not the Son. Get where I'm saying? Like, we're, we're in this 
trap right now where we see the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the prophet Isaiah call the coming Messiah, the Son, his name shall be Everlasting Father. Now what's he trying to do here? Ooh, Isaiah surely knows, well God surely knows, because he wrote it through the prophet Isaiah, that, that God the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. So what does this mean? The Father's not the Son. That's heresy, okay? We've all, like, in the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, and in, in our beliefs, um, to mix up, for, for us to say that the Father is the Son and the Son is the Father, that's, that's heretical. So we don't espouse that. That's not what we're getting at. In fact, there was a whole uh, confusion about this doctrine of the Trinity kind of surrounding this verse and some others that at one point in history um, that the early church fathers and some people were getting together because they, they, all the churches were trying to figure out how to teach this. And so a bunch of people got together, early church fathers and, and, uh, and some of the saints, they got together at what's called the Council of Nicaea. Maybe you've heard of this. In 325 AD, a bunch of uh, theologians got together at the Council of Nicaea. And their, one of their main things was to try to figure out how in the world do we talk and explain this idea of a triune God with one God who eternally exists as three separate personages, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you know, I want to know a cool legend that kind of connects with Christmas that happened at the Council of Nicaea. So St. Nicholas, yes, that St. Nicholas, was at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, along with a, a bunch of other uh, theologians. And uh, one, of, one person uh, named Arius stood up because Arius he espoused the belief that Jesus wasn't fully God, that he was a created being, and that uh, he was, the, he was um, a creation of God, not God himself, the second person of the Trinity. And so Arius stands up and he starts talking about his stance and trying to convince other people that Jesus was less than fully God. And legend has it, okay, there's mixed reports, trust me, it's not... This is not for sure. This is not like they don't have pictures or a video of this, okay? In three, 325 AD, they struggle in the video AV department. Um, but, but legend has it that St. Nicholas, St. Nick, was so mad at Arius that he got up, walked across the room, and punched him in the face. Now, this adds a whole new level when you're talking to your kids about Santa Claus. It says, kids, if you're naughty, you're not just gonna, you may get put on the naughty list, but if you get your theology wrong, Santa's gonna come and punch you in the face. <laughs> now, that's all legend. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that's what legend has it. So what do we do with this? How do we reconcile these things that the Son is the everlasting Father. Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment, but let's look at these two things like we've been doing all throughout this series. There's two words here. The first one is everlasting, the other one is Father. And the first thing we do know for sure, the first thing that we can say with all confidence and all certainty and is not feel a theological minefield is this, Jesus is everlasting. Jesus is everlasting. Lasting. The, the writer of the book of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. He says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means this to us, and you can write this in, it means that Jesus always was. Jesus always was. He's always been. And that's, uh, for some of us, um, especially around this time of year, we see the, the nativity scenes, right? All over the place, nativity scenes. In fact, uh, last night, um, our family went over to that live nativity over off 174th there where they do a living nativity scene um, in front of that church there right on, the, right on the street. It's really cool. We walked through and we, we saw the whole story of Jesus and people there dressed up as those characters. And, and sometimes I think we can get this idea, well, Jesus started, Jesus started at his birth because 
in our minds, that's where we all started, right? We all started there. We all started at the beginning. We all started, um, we all have a beginning place. So we kind of carry that logically, or I think a lot of people carry that logically onto Jesus. And well, Jesus started when he was born in a manger there in, in Bethlehem. But that's not, that's not where Jesus started. You see, Jesus as God has existed eternally. He's always been. It's not just the beginning of Jesus. He has no beginning. He has no end. In fact, the Colossians, one of my favorite passages in all of scripture, Colossians 1 says, he, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, is, uh, that in everything he might be preeminent. In other words, what we see is Jesus here. Jesus has always been, he was at the beginning, he was the active agent in creation. And you know what, I think that's, that's so encouraging for us this morning. Because when we understand that Jesus didn't get his start as a little baby in the, in the barn, but he was actually the, the, the one that was creating and that all things came into creation by him, through him, and for him, you know what that does, says to us? You know what that does to us? It gives us security because it says to us ultimately that we have been created by the very hands of Jesus and that we find our identity in our creator you see our identity is not found in what we choose our identity is not found in what other people may say about us our identity is found by our creator and our creator happens to be Jesus because he's always been he's always we have our just like your kids um, they have your DNA which makes up their biological identity and no one disputes that, right? In fact, when we do something, it, chances are when you're growing up, right, when you do something uh, wrong, whichever parent gets to it first says, that was your genes, right? Those were your genes. That was not my DNA. That was your side of the family for sure, right? We all love to play that we realize because Jesus is the very beginning, he is the one that gives us our identity. So our identity is found solely in our creator, not what the world says about us, because he always was. Jesus always is. You can write that in. Jesus always is. Meaning that he is not just a has-been. Jesus is not just a has-been. Oh, he was so 2,000 years ago. Right? Oh, the Jesus fad, you guys still think that? Like, that was, that was so long ago. Or the thought that, oh, well, God just kind of created the world and spun it into existence, and now he's stepped back and he's just watching chaos ensue. That's not the picture we see. In fact, Jesus, what it means that Jesus always is is that he has always been involved in the present moment. He has always been involved in your present moments. You see, Jesus is not dead, and he, he, he lives forevermore to make intercession for us. He's never ceased to be. He may be out of sight, but he's never ceased to be. You know what it means for us? It means that when we belong to Jesus, he invades our space, and he is with us always. I think for some of us this time of year and this Christmas season, we need to just get our, that would change everything. If we could just live every moment as if Jesus was with us because he is. That he is, that he is present and there's nothing that we do that, that separates us, that, that separates you from him and his love for you. Notice how Paul puts it. I love this. And just listen to the intensity in Paul as he says this in Romans chapter 8. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares to accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. 
Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or per are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. No power of the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us, from, separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is with us in every moment of every day. And you know what that means? In those moments where you feel extremely low and extremely alone, alone, it means you're not separated from God. And sometimes I know because of life and because of our choices and because sometimes we turn our back on Jesus, we turn our back on God and we walk the other direction in disobedience and in sin. It feels like God, it feels like God is far off from you. But let me tell you, God is not far off from you. He's near to you. And he longs for you to turn back around. He's not far. He's with you in every moment. He will never leave you nor forsake you because he is a God who is in the moment. And Jesus will be. Jesus is everlasting. He was, he is, and he always will be. You know when you buy something um, that supposedly has a lifetime warranty? You guys, uh, you know, you see that on the sticker, it says lifetime warranty. Especially like what really cracks me up is um, infomercials. <clears throat> um, infomercials that have the latest and greatest, that as seen on TV stuff that has, that has lifetime warranty on it, right? Um, because uh, what happens if that company goes out of business? Do you still have a lifetime warranty? No, right? We understand that lifetime war the lifetime warranty is only as good as the company staying open, right? The company being able to operate. If the company closed down, lifetime warranty, no longer, right? The same thing is true when we, we talk about promises, right? The promise is only as good as who? Who? The promiser, right? Promises are only as good as the promisor. A lifetime warranty is only as good as the company has the ability to stay open and functioning. Once those things shut down, or if the promiser is not viable, then those things kind of go out the window. And that matters because God's word has so many promises for us. As you read through the passages of the Bible, we have so many promises promises of God to us that are available in Christ Jesus, but the promise, the promises of God's word even are only as good as the promiser and are only as good as the promiser's ability to carry them out. The fact that Jesus was and is and will be forever means that our our lifetime warranty, if you will, our promise is secure in Jesus. Why? Because they tried to kill him, but they couldn't keep him in the grave. He rose victoriously three days later and lives forevermore. And so our promise is sure because our promisor lives forever. Right? So that's what's encouraging about this. This isn't just, oh yeah, he's everlasting. Woo, glad we got that out of the way. Like he was and is and he is, will be forever and that means a whole bunch to us because it means that our eternity is secure in him. It means that our, the promises of God's word are found and secure in him because he exists forevermore. 
I love it what he says, uh, what Jesus says himself in the book of Revelation chapter one. He says this, I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I'm the one who was and who always, or who is and who always was and who is still to come, the, the almighty one. And John, John, just after hearing all this, John says, when I saw him, when I saw Jesus victorious, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and Jesus says this. It went away. Do not be afraid. Uh, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died. But look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and the grave. He says, yeah, yeah, I died. And they thought they could put me in the grave. Satan thought he won. He thought he was victorious. But I rose forevermore. And you know, when I did that, I declared over history, Jesus says, that I am the first and I will be the last. I exist eternally forevermore. And he's, I love this. He says, I am the living one, he says. I died, but look, I'm alive, and I hold the keys to death in the grave. You see what it means that Jesus is everlasting? It means a whole bunch for us. It means because he was, because he was there at the beginning, because he was the active agent in creation, because he created everything that we see around us, and he created you and I, it means that we can derive our identity from him, and that when we look at him, he has placed his identity in us. It means that he is. It means that in every moment you walk through, the hardest moments and the happiest moments, it means that he is there present with you and you can't outrun his love. You can't run away from him far enough where he doesn't love you anymore. And the fact that he always will be means that the promises that are found in scripture of an eternity spent with him, the promises found in scripture of what he wants to do in us, they are sure and they are secure because he beat the grave, and he will exist forevermore. That's what we have available in him. The second part of this phrase, which we've talked about a little bit at the beginning, was this. Jesus reveals to us the Father. You can write this in. Jesus reveals to us the Father. Isaiah isn't teaching, so we set it up earlier talking about how this was a theolo theological conundrum here that the everlasting son was called the everlasting father. And I, I don't think, Isaiah here isn't teaching that God, uh, the son, the second person of Trinity is the same person as God the Father, the first uh, person of Trinity. That's what the early church denounced the, as the idea of mod uh, modalism. Um, it's actually really unlikely that Isaiah even had the idea of the Trinity in his mind as he, as he wrote this. Um, so when he says that Jesus, the Messiah, would be called Everlasting Father, it's not, the, it's not the Messiah's role within the Godhead, but the Messiah's character towards us that he has in mind. Does that make sense? So he's not saying, here's, he doesn't, the, the son is not functioning as the father in the Godhead, but rather he is revealing to us who the father is. He's saying that he is the everlasting father. One author said it this way, he, uh, everlasting father is a descriptive analogy pointing to Christ's character. He, he is fatherly, father-like in his treatment of us. And Jesus backs this up. If we go all the way to, to John chapter 10, Jesus says this of himself. He, Jesus says, I, I and the Father are one. Know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in him. And then in, fast forward in John chapter 14. Um, Jesus says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I uh, am in the Father and the Father is in me? In other words, he's saying, Jesus is saying, I reveal the Father to you. I, if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. If you want to see the perfect image of who the Father is, Jesus says, I want you to look at how I live because I reveal to you who the Father is. If you want to know the character of the Father, the, how he would act towards people, how he would um, interact with people, 
what his thoughts are, his heart. Look at Jesus. How does Jesus reveal the Father to us? He, he cares for people, just like, the father, like a father would. Jesus nurtures sick people back to health, like a good father would. He prays for people, like a father would. He is there for people. He is strong and dependable, just like a father should be. See, fathers, um, if they're anything, they should be for their kids. They should be for their kids. Uh, they should live and do certain things and hold certain places in their life. For instance, fathers ought to believe in their children, believe, that, believe in them and build them up. And surely as we read through the Gospels, Jesus believed in, his, believed in his, his followers and he built them up just like a father would. Fathers ought to be firm but loving and that's exactly how Jesus handled people. Fathers ought to provide uh, a place uh, for, the, for which their children can derive their identity. We've talked about this before, but it's like I, I, we talk often to our kids that, that, that they're atoms. And because they're atoms, it means some certain things. That, that I want them to understand that their identity, they have an identity in their name. And that we do certain things because we're atoms. And certainly as Jesus lived, if we look now for 2,000 years, followers have been saying, I'm a Christian, right? We're Christians. In other words, we are, we are becoming like Christ. We are named after him. Fathers ought to always be thinking and planning about their children's future. And Jesus said this in John chapter 14, that I go to prepare a place for you. Just like a father. So what I'm saying is that that. Jesus shows us pictures, reveals to us who our Father, God the Father is. I'll tell with, share with you just two stories to illustrate the fatherliness of Jesus or how Jesus revealed to us who the Father is. The first one is at one time Jesus was traveling up to Jerusalem and he gets word that, uh, that the king of Jerusalem, Herod, wants to kill him. And so as Jesus is traveling, everybody's saying, don't go to, don't go to Jerusalem, Jesus. Just, just stay outside the city. But Jesus, it says he set his face towards Jerusalem. In other words, fathers do, things hard, do hard things. But he set his face towards Jerusalem. And he, he walks up and he comes up to a place where he can see the entire uh, place, where he can look down on Jerusalem. And only a few hours uh, later, he, he, he would be... Uh, there with there in the city, but he stops for a moment and he says this in Luke chapter 13. He says, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your, uh, gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You hear that tone in Jesus' voice, this this revealing of the Father, this fatherliness of how he acted. He says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, people, how long have I just wanted to gather you in and, and hold you close and keep you safe and protect you, but you weren't willing to. It just kind of gives us a snapshot of Jesus' heart towards his people. Another time, Jesus gets word that a close friend of his is near death and he heads out to the house, but he doesn't get there in time. And his friend Lazarus had died. And if you remember the story, we talked about it this summer. Uh, we preached through it this summer. But, but Jesus comes up and his, uh, Lazarus' sisters run out to meet Jesus there. And uh, they have this really cool interaction. Everybody was there was sobbing. It was in in, in tears and notice what Jesus does when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise and quickly go out they followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him she fell at his feet saying to him Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died and when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. So Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. 
See, he was in the moment and he cared for people just like a good father would do. He, would, he cared for his friends. He cared for his people, so much so that even though he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus, he wept with them just because he cared so deeply for him. Remember at the beginning we talked about how sometimes God is hard to understand. How there's some things about God that we won't ever understand. But I think if we look at the life of Jesus and as we read the Gospels and we learn about who Jesus is, we begin to see a clearer picture, a clearer snapshot of who our Father is. Because he reveals who he is to us. So throughout Jesus, we can see, through, through Jesus, we can see we can see his, the Father's heart. We can understand what his will is, what his desires are. We can grow in our trust for him. But what does this matter? Why do we talk about this? Why do we just spend the last 25 minutes talking about the everlasting Father? What does that have to do with your life today? What does that mean for you tomorrow when you go home or this week as you prepare for Christmas? I think it means a lot for us. Because I think that the fact that Jesus is everlasting and eternal and that he shows us the Father is important for us to grasp because we tend to view everything in life very temporary, don't we? Our scope and what we think of, it's so right here and right now. In fact, as we are sitting here, you're probably thinking about what you gotta do later on today, this afternoon, the Christmas shopping that still has to be done. You still gotta do this, you still gotta do that, you gotta run over here. And, and it's starting to just build on, and, and how many of you throughout, like as we approach Christmas, your stress level begins to rise slightly, pulse begins to raise because there's like, man, we still gotta do some shopping, we gotta get this thing together. Then you're thinking about all the family that's gonna your, invade your home or you're gonna have to hang out with and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't, I mean, I would never say this aloud, but I gotta spend all day with these people and it just stress level begins to rise and you're like, I don't know if we're gonna get everything done and then there's the whole financial part and for some of us, it's like looking at the finances and it just doesn't compute and it's like, oh my goodness, how is this going to work out and and Christmas this time of year that's supposed to be a joy filled and full of hope and full of peace becomes this stress filled moment any of you guys been there this last couple weeks just like ah oh, it's coming and I don't know it's like a wave and it's crashing and and we look at it and we're like I don't know how we're going to get it I don't know what's going to happen and we get so tunnel focused on what's happening do you guys realize this Christmas is going to be over in nine days. Nine days. It's going to be done. And you're going to go on with your life. <laughs> you're going to have to pay off all the... <laughs> Maybe that's what's causing you stress. But it's going to be over in nine days. All that stress, all that thing that you've just been... Maybe it's been keeping you up at night. All that stuff, it's going to be done in nine days. What you've been thinking about and dwelling about, it's going to be done. Maybe for you it's not Christmas, but I know that for each of us, we go through seasons of life and we have different moments in life where, where whether or not those things are revolving around conflict or there's hard times, your family's in a hard time, or you're having issues in relationships, and at the moment, it can feel like it's lasting forever, doesn't it? You're walking through health concerns with loved ones. Doesn't it just seem like those things last forever? And when you start getting tunnel visioned on it, you're like, oh man, and, you, and we start looking down and we're like, this is, this is all consuming and this is gonna be, it's gonna be this way forever. I, I, we're never gonna get beyond this. The rest of my life is gonna revolve around this and we just, uh, maybe I'm the only one, but I just start getting filled with stress and I get filled with just these thoughts of like, oh goodness, what if this lasts forever? And, and we view everything so in the moment that it's so big and it creates so much stress and anxiety and we, we dwell there. And I think it's good for us this morning to remember that we worship a God who is everlasting. 
that he's bigger than the moments we're in that seem so overwhelming to us at the times, that God is, sees the whole picture. To illustrate that, I, I just needed two people to help me out. So anybody want to help me out? Jason, Joe, come on up. Okay. Um, what I need you to do is, uh, Joe, you take this and you walk that way. Jason, you take this whole, come on, you unwrap that and go this way, don't yank him over, okay? You just keep walking out that way, watch out for the tree, Jason, just keep, yep, sorry, I could have made this a whole lot easier, I'm sure. Yep, just keep walking that way, keep going, keep going, as far as you can, just keep going. Yeah, why don't you just, yeah, just go outside, why don't you just go outside, just, just get out of here, just go, okay? Yeah, all right, that's good. You don't have to get wet or anything. It's raining out there. Okay, pull it tight now. Okay, so I want you guys, this, imagine that this rope just goes for infinite, like eternity that way, and, and it just, this rope is forever long that way. It just goes, this is, this is, imagine this is time, right? This is the timeline of eternity. This exists forever. And you know where our lives are if this rope goes forever each way? Our lives are about right here. That's your entire life. That's it. And your days and those things that you've been stressing about that keep you up at night that you, don't, you think will last forever, that's just a little dot on your little timeline in the timeline of eternity. And what I don't mean is for the, that to make you seem like God doesn't care about this because he, old, he died on the cross for this. He died on the cross for your little blip and everybody else's little blip. So I don't mean to make light of, of your situation because I'm sure that the situation you find yourself in this morning or the situations of seasons of life that have seemed so overwhelming, they probably are a huge deal and you have a God who is in those moments with you and who loves you in the midst of those moments. But we have to remember that those things that we stress about, those things that we think will last forever, guess what? They are just a little, little bit in the timeline of eternity. And our God exists outside of this, and he gets to see the whole thing. And so what it means is that God is not stressed or flapped or anxious or worried about what's happening in your life. He... He's not stressed about it. He's not anxious about it. He cares about it, but he's not anxious about it. Why? Because he's already been to the end of when this season of life or this stress ends. He's already been to the end of that and back and seen how it works out, and he's paving the way for you to walk through it if you believe and trust in him. You guys can drop that and come back inside. I'm sure you're cold by now. Yeah, you, just, you can just drop it, Jason. We'll, we'll, we'll pick it up later. But, but friends, I think sometimes we get so stressed and so anxious and so worried about what's happening in the here and now, and we just need a little perspective that we worship a God who's everlasting. He's eternal. He exists outside of time. He exists outside of all that stuff, and he's seen the end of your stress. I remember when my wife was pregnant with, um, with each of our kids, but especially with the firstborn with Caleb, because... Man, it was the first. It was first for us, and we were so. I, I, I was. I was like, man, this. This is going to take forever, right? This nine months. It's taken forever to get here, and then there were certain days towards the end of the pregnancy where we're like, man, this is taking forever, right? Like this is gonna. This is gonna be a life. Like my wife's gonna be pregnant eternally, right? Like, heaven forbid. Uh, like this is gonna last forever, and then. I look back on it now, almost 10 years later. I'm like, well, that was just a, that was just a short blip, right? We, we look back, we're like, that thing that I thought was going to last forever, now is just a small blip on the radar of my life. And again, I don't say these things to, to make you feel like small or that the, that the things you are walking through are insignificant to God because they're not. They are ultimately, they, they are extremely important to God. But when we understand that we have an everlasting Father, when Jesus, our Messiah, is ever, understand that He is everlasting, 
It means that he's already been to the end. He's looked at what's going to happen and he's come back and he's paving the way through it for us. Jesus already knows. Do you realize this? Jesus has already seen how you're going to come through whatever you are looking at today that seems so overwhelming. And when you get on the other side, you may not see it today, but when you get on the other side of it, you will be able to look back and see how God faithfully paved the way and he carried you through that this season if you let the everlasting Father do that for you. Because I can tell you from experience, I can look back and I can see how our everlasting Father, my Savior, paved the way even before we found out that my dad was sick. He started laying in the foundation and paving the way for us without us even knowing it and making decisions. And he paved the way and he carried us all the way through his sickness. And he carried us all the way through when we lost him. And now with some perspective of just even a couple years looking back, I can see how our everlasting father carried us through because we let him. And he wants to do that for you. Whatever season of life you find yourself in this morning that seems overwhelming, that seems daunting, that seems like it's going to last this thing forever, I want you to begin to pause and I want you to take a step back and say, you worship this morning an everlasting God who has seen the end of whatever this stress is in your life, whatever this anxious thing is, whatever this health thing is, whatever this relationship thing is, whatever this conflict is, whatever this job security thing that's stressing you out, whatever whatever you're going through whatever your kids are backslidden or they're 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 not backslidden yet but they're headed that direction or they're stressing you out the whatever the moment you're walking in right now God Jesus has been to the end of that and back and he's seen how you're going to walk through it and he wants to help you walk through it he wants to faithfully walk you through it he wants to pave the way for you through it will you rely on him Will you believe in the everlasting Father who stands outside of your problems and is willing to carry you through these things? And I hope you do because when you get to the end of it, you'll be able to look back and you say, wow, that was not easy. But I can see how God faithfully walked with us and how my Savior saved us in the midst of that problem. That's why this matters. That's why it matters this morning that we worship an everlasting Father. That's why tomorrow it matters when you wake up in the stress of Christmas or the stress of work or you're putting on your clothes to go to work and you're like, it's going to be this way forever. Or you're dealing with a parenting issue where you're like, this is going to be forever. Or you're dealing with family conflict and you guys are sitting there on Christmas Day with all the in-laws and you're like, today is going to last forever. Uh, you'll be able to step back outside of outside of that and say, no, we worship an everlasting God, which says to me that he will carry me through this and that he'll carry us right on through. And because his promise is sure, because the promiser is sure, he will carry us all the days of our life and then carry us into eternity where we can spend the rest of our days forever, the rope going that way, we'll spend forever that way with our everlasting father our mighty God, our wonderful counselor, our prince of peace.